I came to very soon. Curse it, spite that ever I was born to set it. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? This is the excellent foppery of the world. My first memory of really being stirred by Shakespeare's language is in one of the sonnets, sonnet number 29, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, it begins. And that uh, was a, a poem that made an impression on me in my adolescence at a time when romantic ideas were beginning to come to the surface. Uh, as, as with many people, the sonnets, of course, are, are very great. Some of them are very great love poems. And that really made a big impression on me. I was also able in Hull to see a touring company led by a very great actor, Donald Wolfitt, who was uh, an unfashionable actor but he was one of the greatest of King Lear's. I saw him play Othello in Hull, which was, uh, again, an important experience for me. And it was partly because of the interest that I'd developed in Shakespeare, in theatre more generally, and in music too, that I chose as an undergraduate to go to London, to University College London. And while there, I had some fine Shakespeare teachers, Though in those days, university teachers were far less interested in Shakespeare in the theatre than we have since become. I remember once telling my tutor, who was a very fine literary critic, I said to her I was going to see Michael Redgrave as Hamlet that evening. She said, oh, I'd like to see Hamlet sometime. Uh, I don't know whether she ever did, but um, the most intense experience I had in the theatre in that time was Olivier's Richard III. Uh, to see that on stage from the top gallery of the new theatre in that wonderful old Vic season of 1949 was a very powerful experience and I was very conscious at the end of seeing that that I'd been in the presence of great acting. It was a very uh, a very sensationally uh, fine performance. And I saw other fine Shakespeare when I was an undergraduate too. Redgrave as Hamlet, a lovely production of Love's Labour's Lost at the, at the Old Vic in, I think, 1949. Uh, we had Redgrave again. And Olivier and Vivian Lee in Antony and Cleopatra at St. James's Theatre. Uh, so all those things uh, led me to uh, feel that Shakespeare was important for me. These were things that, that made me want to go on taking interest in Shakespeare, teaching Shakespeare as I, as I went on to do, and uh, eventually researching and, and editing Shakespeare, of course. When I came here to Stratford as a graduate student in 1959, that was a very important time to come here, in fact, because it was a season when Edith Evans was playing in All's Well That Ends Well, a, a great production by Tyrone Guthrie, one of the most polished and exciting productions I've ever seen. And Paul Robeson was playing Othello, not very well. And uh, Charles Lawton was wonderful as Bottom in The Midsummer Night's Dream, not so successful as King Lear. But for me, the great highlight of that season was the Coriolanus in which Olivier was Coriolanus. And I remember at the end of that, I was so knocked back by it that I just walked around the streets of Stratford for 20 minutes, not wanting to talk to anybody at all. It was such an overwhelming experience. The intensity of his performance, the intelligence of it, and also the fact that Edith Evans was playing Volumnia, their scenes together were very powerful. And also, around about that time, I saw lovely productions by Peter Hall, his earliest productions, when he had directed the, the Midsummer Night's Dream with Charles Lawton, and a very beautiful Twelfth Night that he directed then with, Pe uh, with Dorothy Chutin as Viola. I must have seen that at least a dozen times, partly because at that time I was uh, teaching courses here for the British Council and they would ask me to go along with, with the students to see them. So I would stand at the back of the stalls often and see these, these productions. So these were all things that enthused me about Shakespeare in the theatre. And they're, thing, they're experiences which also have 
informed my editorial work. I mean, I'm general editor of the of the Oxford Complete Works and also now of the Penguin Shakespeare editions. And in editing plays and in supervising the editing of plays by other people, I've always attempted to take perhaps more than usual care that they're presented in a way which pays full attention to their theatrical values. I hope that the editions that I've produced are useful for actors. I've tried to, well, for example, in small matters like the punctuation of the play, perhaps not all that small, uh, not to, uh, to punctuate in a way that's both helpful to the reader, but also not to over-direct the actor. To, and we've also, <coughs> in the Oxford Complete Works, paid special attention to stage directions, again, trying to see, as we edited, trying to see the play on stage and, and to realise it in the, edit, in the edited version in theatrical terms. I think the greatest of the plays is King Lear, which I did edit myself. I spent three years, of, as soon after I retired from being a professor, I was able to spend more time then on writing uh, uh, on my own personal work, and I edited King Lear for my Oxford edition then. And I increasingly came to feel that King Lear is the greatest, I would say, of all plays. Uh, and there are passages in that which stick in my mind, which recur. I mean, one of them is a very simple line, why should a horse, a dog, a rat have life, and thou no breath at all? says Lear over the body of Cordelia. And it's, it's in lines of great simplicity like that, which also nevertheless seem to me to be lines of great profundity. Uh, it's, such, it's such writing, I think, that helps to make Shakespeare, well, to use the old word, universal. It's true that most of Shakespeare's plays are based on pre-existing stories, but it's also true that Shakespeare reshaped those stories, plotted them in ways that considerably changed the, the structure. He made them into dramas from, in some cases, poems like the poem of Romeo and Juliet, uh, the, the play of Romeo and Juliet, which he, he, which he bases on the long poem Romeo and Juliet, uh, or, or, or like the history plays, or uh, the, the English history plays, or the Roman history plays too, which he bases on Plutarch, but he changes such so much and it's he who turns them into drama, into plays. I think Shakespeare did know what audiences wanted, but I think he also taught them what they ought to want. You see, I have a great respect for the audiences of Shakespeare's time. I entirely disagree with the view that his audiences were full of people who just wanted to get easy pleasure, that, that, that he wrote some of the, uh, wrote down to his audiences. Uh, I have, it seems to me that the audiences of Shakespeare's time uh, helped him to create the great plays that he did. He helped to shape, shape their taste because he, he stretched them, he stretched their in intelligence, he stretched their responses. The audiences that could make a popular success of plays as intellectually and emotionally demanding as Hamlet or Othello or King Lear is an audience that deserves respect. Those plays are just as demanding as, for example, Wagner's operas or uh, or, or Verdi's late works, and far more demanding than most plays that are on the West End stage at the, at the moment, except, of course, Shakespeare's own. Literacy is not, is not a necessary qualification for responding to language. You don't have to be able to write yourself to be able to understand or respond imaginatively to the sort of writing that Shakespeare gives his audiences. The audience, anyhow, I think the audiences of Shakespeare's time probably included a high proportion of people who had had the same sort of education as he had at the grammar school, at grammar schools all over the country, which gave people a very fine education. It was only the boys who got it, uh, except for the very privileged girls. The education that the boys got was an education in rhetoric and in oratory, which naturally fitted them, therefore, to respond to the rhetoric and the oratory that Shakespeare gives them in his plays. I try to be open-minded about style of productions of Shakespeare plays. I don't go to the plays only expecting one particular style, a naturalistic style, for example, 
or I don't go to them necessarily expecting that they will uh, be entirely faithful to the text, uh, or, or and I certainly don't don't go to them hoping for an Elizabethan for neo Elizabethanism. I mean, it can work. Uh, you can get good productions in what the Globe calls the original practices style. You can get bad ones in that style too, as you can, I think, in any style. I go to a production, I hope open-mindedly, thinking that if it works, it's, it's good. Uh, and modern dress productions can work extremely well. Uh, so can productions which are in uh, indeterminate periods, sometimes you get eclectically set productions where the costumes, for example, uh, are you know, some of one period and some of another. That can work very well too. Uh, and similarly, you can get productions which import modern meanings into the plays. Uh, you can get politically oriented productions, productions which are clearly inviting us to draw parallels with the significant events of perhaps of our own time or perhaps of other times even, that other than Shakespearean times. You can get productions which are set, say, in the Napoleonic Wars, for example, uh, as I've seen a Coriolanus uh, done in, in that sort of period, which worked well. It was a way of trying to draw the audience in by, by inviting them to, to make parallels and perhaps also by helping them to uh, understand a play which is about the politics of ancient Rome, which perhaps they don't know so much about through the politics of a later period, which they may be more familiar with. And of course, I've seen politically oriented productions. Uh, we, I remember when I was in Moscow once, seeing a production of Hamlet, which was very clearly subversive in its intention. It was clearly uh, politically uh, reverberant, uh, and I was told at the time that uh, well, the same was true when I was in Czechoslovakia, that directors often use Shakespeare to help the audiences to uh, express their own di dissent with the regime, and that the communist regime would sometimes actually encourage that as a sort of safety valve. Uh, for, for, from the point of view of the audience. One thing I would say is that I know a lot of very nice and very good and very intelligent people who don't care about Shakespeare. Nobody has a moral duty to like Shakespeare, and people shouldn't feel inferior if they don't. Uh, I think there's a, a bit of a danger that we Shakespeareans uh, feel a bit superior about our, our, our passion for Shakespeare. It's good to have a passion for Shakespeare, but there's nothing wrong with you if you don't. Thank you.